So, as I mentioned yesterday, um, today, kind of an abnormal day, uh, you're going to have two government classes instead of government and Bible. Um, so we place government over God. Okay. Uh, um, <laughs> no. Um, remember that's funny. God is government. What Mr. Thompson says in his class. Is, <laughs> the lesson on the Yeah. <laughs> Although government does seem to think it is God from time to time. But, um, so, your your homework, I uh, put it under systematic theology, although it would be, it, it, it will be under government. Um, you got to give me, as usual, a one-page summary of our class time for day. So our guest, we mentioned yesterday, our guest is Peter Theron, who is running for Congress here in Wisconsin's 2nd District. He's running against Mark McCann. Uh, he's got his job two years ago, and so Mr. Theron is hoping to unseat him and uh, become the next congressman from our district. So I'm going to give it over to you. Uh, as a start towards your one-page summary, I've given you a handout, which is completely one page. So, oh, does it count? Oh, no. Does it count? No. no. So you can't copy it verbatim, but you can get things, some things from it. Okay. The, what we're going to do is a little bit of math. So math comes before government comes to uh, I am, in fact, a math instructor and a PhD in mathematics. Uh, but what we're talking about here is math as it relates to your future. So first of all, we're going to talk about compound interest. Compound interest, you, you would deal with how? Anyone? know anything that you do right now economically that deals with compound interest? Bank accounts, right? Bank accounts, savings accounts earn interest and typically it's a compound interest. And, and what compound interest means is that you get interest on interest. Um, Albert Einstein in fact referred to compound interest as the most potent force in the universe. That's the secular universe. For the first line, we are at what I refer to as the Dublin National Bank. Did I do something right? That's not how you go to Chicago. Okay, so so if Okay, so we'll just that's D O U B L I M. Um, I've got a Sharpie, but I think if I was to use it then <laughs> that would be a non thing. Um, but you've got you've got much of, much of this filled in, so that's actually going to work out well for us. Yeah. Don't don't do don't, that. Don't do that. Just try it once. <laughs> it's not your thing. It's not important in the corner. It's one of these things where I was a, a computer instructor, so I had, had to deal with various and sundry technology, and even worse than using a sharpie or a dry erase marker on one of these boards is using a dry erase marker on a regular screen because that's nice and pebbled and so it doesn't come off very well. So I always make sure, you know, okay, what's the proper marker for this? So you just saved my job is what you're saying. I, yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we put, we put 50, 50, yeah, so $50 into the Dublin National Bank, that's the gray line here. It's Dublin, so it gets 100% interest. So how much interest will we earn in one year? Right? 50 times 1, 50 bucks. So how much do we have in the account after one year? $100. $100, right? 50 plus 50, $100. Now we go, unfortunately, the Dublin National Bank is not in Ireland. It's actually in Air One, which is nowhere spelled backwards. So we go across the street to the Bank of 1%. And there we put in $99 and a penny. Okay, we got only 1% interest. So how much interest do we earn after a year? 99 cents, right? 99.01 times 1 penny. So you bought that 1%. So 90.99. So now adding that interest to the 99.01, what do we have at the end of the year? Again, 100. All right, that's interest in just in general. 
Now we're going to go for compound interest with two years. Put $25 in the Dublin National Bank. So at the end of one year, I got $25 in interest. How much do I have at the end of one year? 50. Okay. So now I'm back up to this line. $50 for the second year. I'll earn $100 at the end of two years. Going to the bank of 1%. And I put 9803. This number is skillfully chosen. We get 98 cents in interest. So what's the balance at the end of one year? 9901. Notice it's not 100 here yet. It's 9901, which then after the second year becomes 100. This is where, this is compound interest. The interest we earn, so that $25 also earned interest going forward. So interest upon interest, compound interest, is used in savings. It's also used when you're dealing with epidemics. Because the idea, the, what happens there is one person gets sick. That person gets two more people sick. Each of them get two more people sick. Okay? You've got compounding going out there, and that's why an epidemic can spread so quickly. Okay, so I know that if I want $100 in two years, it depends where I go. If I go, so now I need $100. In two years, I'd like to give my wife a $100 gift certificate. How much money do I have to put in the Dublin National Bank now to have $100 in two years? $25. However, if I, if I don't have the Dublin National Bank, but have the bank of 1%, now how much money do I need to put in to the bank account to have $100 in two years? 9803. So the amount you need to put in to have $100 in the future depends very much on the interest rate. If the interest rate is high, 100%, that's pretty high, the amount I put in is low. If the interest rate is low, the amount I have to put in is high. Now we come to what's called unfunded liability. Suppose I don't have $25. So I say, well, gee, I don't have $25 now. Um, I'll wait and I'll put in what I need to next year. If I'm at the Dublin National Bank, how much do I have to put in next year if I don't put in $25 now? I've got to put in 50. So I've got to put in not only what I didn't put in now, but also that additional interest. An unfunded liability is you haven't deposited enough, so you have to do something to make it up down the road. So what I have down there, it's not just kicking the can down the road. It says, oh, I'll do that tomorrow. I'll do that next year. I'll do that you know, in a week. It's kicking a snowball down the mountain. As it goes, it grows. Unfunded liability in your future. The government has made promises to pay money in the future. It's promised to pay me Social Security. It may have promised to pay Mr. Thompson. Um, and so there are prom it, it, and have any of you gotten a paycheck? You've gotten a little FICA deduction there? So the government's actually promised to pay you money in the future. So there's a lot of future promises that have been made. But the government hasn't put enough money in the bank account to have that. So that's what's called an unfunded liability. The liability because it's a promise and it's unfunded because you haven't put the money aside. There are three ways to fix an unfunded liability. As I noted down at the bottom of the chart, you can, first of all, pay what you owe. Okay? Rather than skipping this year's payment, I put in my $25. Secondly, 
Suppose I've only got forty dollars. Should I try to should I go to the bank of one percent if I want a hundred, or should I go to the bank to the Dublin bank? Dublin, right? So if I haven't got enough money, a better interest rate will help me out. Okay. So improving the interest rate will also relieve an unfunded liability. And the third option is, rather than giving my wife a hundred dollar gift certificate, suppose I want I want to, can only give her decide to only give her seventy dollars. If I if I decrease this balance at the end, what do you think will happen to my required deposit? Do you think it will go up or do you think it will go down? Go down. Go down. Okay. So decreasing the amount promised in the future. Okay, so we've got those three possibilities. Pay what we owe now, get a better interest rate, or decrease the promises. Here's the kicker. The unfunded liability for Social Security plus Medicare plus Medicaid, plus public pensions are greater than our national wealth. So we would have to, even if we put everything you own, I own, Mr. Thompson owns, the school, everything in the country up on eBay, even eBay up on eBay, and said to the, to the world, okay, you know, bid for it, we get what it's worth, and it's still not enough to put in the bank. So we can't pay the unfunded liability. So how's that going to affect you? Well, the promises that have been made to you are very far in the future. Medic uh, at this point, Social Security's retirement age is 67. It'll take you a number of years to get there. So by the time that happens, you know, myself, Mr. Thompson, we'll have also, we'll also have been taking advantage of those promises. And so there'll be less money there. So if we do nothing, the, the, the promises get shrunk. The other option is increasing the interest rate. And for us, what that means is in economic growth. If we're growing only at 1%, we're at the bank of 1%. If we can get up to 2%, 3%, we're not at the Dublin, we'll never be at the Dublin National Bank, frankly, but increasing that interest rate over the course of, of decades has a tremendous effect. So that's why, well, when I, I talk to folks like yourselves, I just talked to the Beloit Daily News, gave them the same um, worksheet, went through and said, we need to talk about economic growth. We need to be thinking about economic growth we, everything we do, saying, okay, we have to be increasing economic growth. There, now, there's always trade-offs. Okay, if you're focusing on economic growth, then there are other things you're not, that, that, that you're saying, okay, we're willing to let a little bit of this slide. So, in some sense, for economic growth, one of the thing, ways that, that we encourage that would be decreasing taxes and regulation. But if you decrease taxes, at least initially, that means that government has less money. So government's paying for fewer things. Again, the trade-off there. With economic growth, we hope to eventually be able to, to, to um, pay off these promises. But it does mean that we might have to forego a few government, a few government benefits now. So that's the initial that I wish to give you. And I hope that I've, got, that I've helped you get at least a start on that one-page summary. And now for the rest of it, um, time for, for questions. Yeah. Um, do you prefer to stand or sit? Or? I'll, I'll stand because right. this way I get to wave my hands. <laughs> sure. Okay. Well, here, here's my first question for you. I, first, uh, I thank you for the illustration. Help us see okay, all right, what, we're, what we're actually dealing with here. Because when we talk about economic issues, sometimes it kind of goes over your head where you think, who cares about the deficit, you know, it doesn't affect me right now, but it does. Um, so let's actually st let's start there. Um, as a Christian school, you can probably imagine we talk a lot about social issues. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we just, uh, this Tuesday, we had our pro-life day, um, so that was a big issue. We talked about that day. Uh, we talked about marriage and other things. Um, but we think it's sometimes a mistake that the social conservative would make 
is these are the important things, so forget about everything else. Mm -hmm. But the economy is, in, in some sense, a moral issue. Mm -hmm. um, so why should the economy be uh, an important issue for us to consider? Okay. Um, one thing I would say is, is that um, when you, if, if, your, if your choice is between prosperity and poverty, when you're prosperous, you're able to do more things. So a prosperous country like the United States can, re, can do things like research into vaccines. We can do things like uh, provide medical aid. We can, uh, so a prosperous country has extra, and the, and the United States has traditionally been very, very generous with the extra that, frankly, God has given us. Um, so I would say that one thing is, you know, again, economic growth, ha prosperity, first of all, it helps lift people, lift Americans out of poverty. If there are more jobs, um, there are more opportunities, then people are able to, uh, to work as opposed to uh, ending up on, say, disability or long-term unemployment. Uh, the lack of, lack of work, it, sap, it saps you economically, but it also saps you spiritually. Uh, because uh, work is not simply a chore. Work can often be a great blessing. It can, it can give you a great deal of structure to your life. It can give you a great deal of purpose. So having work, having an economy that has a lot of options for work so that someone does not feel, okay, I have to do this job because it's the only one that exists. Well, being able to say, okay, there's, there's a different job. I can move someplace else. I can, I can transfer. I can, I can go to a different company. I can start my own business. I can do something that I feel called to do. Uh, a, a prosperous economy, a growing economy, has that kind of flexibility. An economy that's not prosperous, that's not growing, has many fewer opportunities, and so their people get, tend to get locked in. Um, one thing to remember from the Middle Ages, the medieval period, was they had guilds. And what a guild meant was, what your father did, you did. That's why we have names like Johnson um, and Thompson. And so your father was a Tomp, and um, I don't know what a Tomp did. But <laughs> that, so it mattered who your father was, because that was what you were going to do. Well, for many people, doing what their father did is something that they like, because they grow up with it. It's, it's great. But for some people, they might be allergic to sawdust, and so being a carpenter just doesn't work. Well, if you're in a guild system, locked in, it's all right, you're just going to be sniffling. Okay? Whereas here, you know, you're able to change to another job. You're not forced to be a carpenter simply because your father was. Well, I think also just to add to that, you know, when the economy is stable, uh, that adds stability to my family. If I'm out looking for work and I can't provide for my family, then that's, that's a big issue. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that will affect all members of my family. But you also mentioned that a stable economy, a good economy, lifts people out of poverty. Now, you're a Republican, and I'm told that you don't want that. Uh, you want poor people to be poor. You don't care about the poor. Um, so, how do you think that, that, that false idea? I, I, okay, I, first, first of all, um, that is false. Um, the, the Republicans care very much about um, those who, who are in poverty, uh, those who are uh, in situations where they, 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 they are not, for whatever reason, able to take advantage of, of opportunities. Um, and, but one thing that the Republicans know is that the, the private sector, um, private enterprise, the free enterprise system, which allows you to the flexibility to say, okay, I'm not doing, I'm not doing well here, I will move. Uh, for example, at this point, um, the, the, uh, I just read that in North Dakota, there are three jobs for every worker, three openings for every worker. So someone who um, is able, you know, someone who perhaps is just a, um, a little bit older than yourself, just out of high school, has no other uh, attachments to Wisconsin, says, I'm going to go out to North Dakota and, you know, perhaps make quite a bit of money. Um, we've all seen the, the deadliest catch, I, I presume. Um, those folks in one season make a significant amount of money. But yeah, it's an incredibly risky job. But you know, as, as the captain says, my job is to make you wealthy. Your job is to keep you safe. So 
for those people who want that, our economy allows you to do that. Um, other economies would say, no, sorry, that's the, the, the plan. We've got our, we've got our, our uh, crab, mm, crab fishermen, we've got our oil workers, you're none of those, so you're stuck on the farm. Um, <coughs> being able to, to move if you need to, because frankly, moving the, the mobility we have in the United States has been one of our great assets. The ability for, particularly folks of your age, um, who you're just starting out, so you're able to go someplace else. Someone like myself, um, with a wife, Kevin, um, with, with also family responsibilities, he, we're, less, we're less able to pack up and go, although if we have to, we, we could. Um, again, the, uh, the U.S. economy allows that. But as you mentioned, the, having employment, being able to provide for your family, very important not only economically and nutritionally, but also, again, spiritually, to be able to say, yes, I'm the provider. You know, I'm taking care of my family. Um, and that's, that's very, very important uh, for, for, for someone's uh, spiritual well-being. All right, questions? Tian. Uh, as according to your speaking, I'm assuming you're a Christian. That's correct. And how does that affect your political view? Um, again, the... You know, my, my feeling is that, that the, uh, being a Christian, um, because it allows people, it, it encourages people to um, believe that there is a, a, an authority above government. Um, and so we realize government does not have the answers. And so that's why as, as a, a, small, a small government conservative, and I, I said, okay, I'm not looking to government to provide answers to my life. I'm, I'm saying I, I have those from God, and, um, I, and, and then again, I don't want government interfering with of the answers I have. I mean, we, we're seeing now the case in Idaho, which I probably have, have spoken of, um, where, the, where a, a Christian couple is, is being forced under the penalty of fines, very significant fines, um, to, to do something that they find sinful, mainly um, marrying same-sex couples. Uh, we, we, and we've also, you probably dealt with the, the bakers and the baker and the photographer. And, yeah, so, so many of the, 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 you know, the, those kind of things where the government is coming in and saying, you know, you are going to have to, to, to practice your religion differently. No. As a Christian, I, I, I um, resi resist that as, as, as much as I can. Other questions? Yeah, sir. With the uh, nation's debt and everything, do you think if you do a certain amount of interest, do you think it could be reduced or even limited in like 20 years in the future? The, th thanks for the question on the, on the debt, because again, that's something that's going to affect you. Um, at this point, it's almost $18 trillion. Um, By the way, how many, how many zeros does trillion have? Too many. They're <laughs> very good. Very, I think it's like 12. It's 12. Okay. Yes. It's billion. Yeah. Um, so uh, a trillion, and then if you if you divide it, we've got roughly 300 billion. So there's still the billion, the trillion. So you're talking about roughly a hundred thousand dollars that you owe right now. Anybody able to just write that check? Most of us can't. <laughs> um, yeah. And 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 Mr. Thompson, you know, money bags there. Over here. Yeah. <laughs> um, so writing, yeah, so, so writing, you know, writing the check for what we owe on the national debt, and again, the national, we've got that debt plus this. We're talking about here. This is 80, 90 trillion. Okay. So on top of that, we've got these unfunded liability. So the the, the, the whole cascade there is is just an incredible amount. How can we fix it? Well, we got into it a little bit at a time, and so we're going to probably have to get out of it sort of a little bit at a time. Um, what I'd like to do is is cap the cap federal spending. Um, the only way you can ever get a government, any government, state, local, federal government, to actually um, uh, to actually have a, a, a surplus is 
to prevent it from increasing spending. The other, the, the other option people will, will toy with is, oh, we'll just increase taxes, we'll get more revenue in. But it, across the board, across the world, whenever an office holder sees more money coming in, they spend it immediately. So we have to cap spending. If we do that, ultimately, uh, the revenues will keep increasing. So cap spending, increase revenue, finally we get to a surplus. Because only by the federal government running surpluses are we going to be able to pay down the debt. Um, we were actually sort of on, on, a, uh, on the path to do that back in the late 90s um, for technical reasons that the debt actually did not decrease, but we did actually run, the government ran surpluses. Um, the technical reason is that that Social Security money that's taken out of your check, that actually goes on to the debt. Um, so, Social Security is, is increasing our debt even as uh, we're still handling with this unfunded liability. So, we, depending, the, the, the more we, the, the faster we can create a larger surplus, the faster we'll be able to pay it down. But realize the federal government budget right now is about $4 trillion. So, even if we said, okay, not doing anything next year but paying off the debt, going to still take us five years. Um, so that's that's minimum to pay it down. Before we go to the next question, just to make sure, if you haven't already, make sure you get that concept of unfunded uh, liability. If you haven't written that down yet, promise the government is making in the future that it does not have the money to cover. So make sure you've got that concept down. All right, any other questions? What other questions? Well, you mentioned uh, same-sex marriage. And that's been an issue recently here in Wisconsin. So, uh, where do you stand, and what do you believe, or, or do you believe the federal government has a responsibility in this at all, or should it just be left up to the states? I believe that marriage is um, between a man and a woman. What I was the, the if, if I was talking to a a non theological board uh, audience. Okay, so, so out in the, you know, on the street. What I would point out is that for every species, we're talking hemlocks, humans, periwinkles, people, the important thing, the critical thing biology tells us for that, for that species is to produce offspring, life. offspring but more than, more than just offspring. Life. More life. Yeah, okay. But notice that a, a, a donkey and a horse it will produce a mule, but if I put two mules together, they, would not produce they, they, they don't produce. So offspring is not sufficient, it's grandchildren. Okay. So every species, <coughs> if it doesn't produce grandchildren, it's gone. So we have human history, pre, you know, recorded and before that, are trying to produce grandchildren. Our societies, you know, remember up until very recently, the, the traditional state of any society, hunter-gatherer, farmer, I don't care what, the traditional state was three letters, W-A-R. They were fighting. They always were fighting. You had to be able to produce grandchildren even under a situation where a significant portion of your population was getting wiped out by disease and by marauders. So that's a significant pressure. You do not have many, you know, if, 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 if you as a society get that wrong, you're gone. So societies that got it wrong aren't around. They're already gone. Our society, Western civilization, Got it right. Marriage, man and a woman, best way of raising kids, best way of ensuring that those kids produce kids and raise kids who will produce, again, more grandchildren. So what I would say to a secular audience is grandchildren trump. Okay? If you're not producing grandchildren, then your society is going to go away. Now, some, some of the secular audience will say, great, we want the United States to go away. Well, frankly, I believe the United States has been the greatest force for good 
certainly in my lifetime and perhaps um, in human history. So I do not want this society to go away, and that's why um, I believe, as I said, um, the uh, marriage is a man, one man, one woman. Raising, again, if, if the best situation is raising their biological offspring. Well, we've talked about issues that hit the wallet, and in my wallet, I don't have a whole lot. Well, I have, I have a few books today, but Ooh. I also have my ID. Voter so, ID. Yes, voter ID. Yeah. Um, where, where do you stand on, on voter ID? That's been an issue uh, here in Wisconsin. Uh, not at the federal level, but... Um, I, in my wallet, I also have a, 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 an ID. Um, what they, although I have to tell you the, the, the story, you probably have heard it. It says that if you look like your passport photo, you probably shouldn't travel. <laughs> um, and I, I'm not sure if you look like your driver's license, you probably shouldn't drive. Um, but having an ID, we use it for so many things in this, in this country. Using it to vote, frankly, I think is, um, it, it's in some sense, it's, it's morally required. Because the vote is important. And it, it's important that only those who are legally allowed to vote, vote. And so this saying that, well, we don't want to disenfranchise anyone. Well, if you're allowing people who are not legally entitled to vote, you are in fact disenfranchising those who are legally entitled to vote. There was a news story that Barack Obama went back to Chicago to vote early. At the poll, guess what? They asked him for his driver's license. Now, figure they probably knew who he was because, you know, the Secret Service comes in first. Uh, but they still asked him for his driver's license. If he can show a driver's license in that situation, we can do that in Wisconsin, too. Let's, um, let's switch here. Did you, you have a question? Yeah, yes. Yeah, um, you said something about um, um, letting people have their own offsprings. Mm -hmm. Their own offsprings and grandchildren. So, um, I was wondering what is your viewpoint about those that already made abortions and those kids that are already <coughs> being, uh, uh, that are, that are being aborted and those that are in um, um, homes, uh, homeless homes, like what is your viewpoint on adoption and the rest? What do you think about oh, that? Uh, I think adoption is a, is a, is a, is a wonderful thing and, and those who, I, I, I've known some uh, families who are have adopted. In fact, um, you might, might have read that Brad Schimmel, the Republican candidate for Attorney General, in fact, he and his wife adopted two, two girls. Um, so both of their children are, in fact, adopted. Um, and, uh, adoption is wonderful, and, and I, you know, it should be encouraged in those, in those cases where um, the, the mother or the family decides that they cannot raise a child. Um, and that's, so, so that's, that's very definitely uh, something that uh, um, that I, I'm, I would encourage and, and believe we should have more of. One thing that it, I, I will touch on this, uh, um, and it's, it's an issue that probably is going to, to, to bubble up, and that's what's called surrogacy, particularly in terms of same-sex marriage, um, or I should say same-sex, whatever you want to call them, something other than marriage, maybe a better word. Um, and that is that um, the, the, there is a move afoot to commercialize where um, a, a woman will contract that yes, I will, I will bear a child for um, a, a childless couple, uh, in, in this case, a same-sex couple. That commercialization, I think, is, is very morally questionable. Again, the, uh, the child is, is being deprived essentially of one biological parent um, and perhaps even two. So watch out for surrogacy. You'll probably see it bubbling in the news, um, and, and that's you know, it, it, that's a moral issue uh, that we will have to wrestle with. What about like, just those couples that have minor and like they just are sterile, like they can't produce? Like, would you well, say the, just, like, one I, I, the, 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 the problem is mostly with um, the, uh, uh, the the the, sa the same sex couples. A, 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 uh, a man and a woman can't produce children. Again, adoption is very definitely an option there. Um, surrogacy, 
I, I, again, I think that there's there's potential issues. So you don't there. you don't want women selling their womb, basically. I think that's yes. So, uh, Uji. Um, so what's your opinion on the minimum wage? The 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 minimum wage is a is is an issue that sounds very good. I I I, I put it under what I call pathological altruism, and that is, it sounds like they're doing the workers a favor, but the, the ultimate effect is they're actually harming workers. Um, because um, if the, as the minimum wage is increased, that means that there are fewer jobs, um, and so there are fewer opportunities for people to get into the workforce. Thomas Sowell, uh, the, uh, the, the great economist, talks about when he entered the workforce, uh, the minimum wage at that time was, was uh, pennies, and he was very, he didn't, he didn't like it, uh, but he, he said, okay, this is all my work is worth now. I will learn more, I will gain more skills, and then be worth more to my employer. It's important to realize that for, uh, people the, the minimum wage is a starting wage. It, you should be saying, okay, I'm, my foot is in the door, now I'm going to grow from there. Um, and so I would actually want them, would prefer the minimum wage to be lower so more people can get that foot in the door and then, and then grow. Any other questions? Well, let's, let's change here a little bit. One of the things we haven't talked about in, in government yet is foreign policy. Um, and some of the <laughs> we're still we're we're still studying the Constitution. Okay. And we're going to spend a little bit of time on that since. Well, there there, 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 there there there's a, there's an article fairly soon that talks about declaration of yes. war. Yes. Um, one of the uh, the two big issues we're dealing with right now in terms of foreign policy, Ebola, and ISIS. Mm -hmm. So let's start off with ISIS. Um, is it time to go back into Iraq? Do we put boots on the ground? so to speak there, how do we handle uh, this matter? Okay, um, first of all I think we, uh, we need to realize that Iraq was stable in part because we did have boots on the ground. Those uh, boots, uh, our American forces were withdrawn uh, by this administration and um, the, that, that, was, that, that caused the problem. So. You need to sort of know, okay, what caused the problem, and unfortunately, it's like Jenga. Okay, you just pulled out that, and now it's fallen down, and just say, oh, I'm going to put it back in. Well, guess what? The rest of it doesn't just reassemble, unless you're running the tape backwards. Um, so, the where we are right now in uh, with, with Syria and Iraq, ISIS is taking over. We have some allies in that region, Israel and the Kurds uh, primarily. We've seen that the Iraq army, even though we trained them, has pretty much sort of evaporated as ISIS has come forward, saying, okay, we're going to, we're going to try to get more allies in the region. Uh, the allies we, we had before haven't panned out. I'm not sure that others will do well, do them even as well. So we may very well end up with American military back in Iraq to fix the problem um, that, and that's, that, that's something to always remember is again, U.S. force for good. U.S. forces in Iraq, right now, um, President Obama is actually, uh, he had been saying that he was going to withdraw all the forces from Afghanistan, but because Iraq disintegrated so quickly, it became politically impalatable for him to say that, and so now we're actually going to leave a force in Afghanistan um, to, to hopefully keep that nation a little bit better together um, than, uh, than what we had previously. So we will see U.S. forces um, in areas, U.S. forces left in areas because that, that uh, helps with stability there. As far as Ebola, um, the, uh, what's interesting is Senegal had one case. So one, one person flew into Senegal and they quarantined and, and did right and, and essentially no one got Ebola from that Senegal case. The U.S. had one case, flew into Dallas. Well, we managed not to handle it right and we got two more from that. So again, one to two 
to try to, to, to uh, quarantine thereafter. So Senegal was able to do it right. Nicaragua, uh, Nigeria ended up with two different loci. One person flew in, infected some people. One of those infected people flew to a different spot in Nigeria. So they had two different loci. They again worked with quarantines um, and again had, had much better hazmat protocols than we have. And we're, Nigeria is also now considered Ebola free. What have they done? Number one, travel bans. You cannot get from Liberia into Nigeria, Liberia into Senegal, closing borders. Also, quarantines. We need to be as serious about Ebola as Senegal, Nigeria, South Africa, the other African countries. Well, one last question, uh, as we have like just a minute or two left. Um, these guys are going to go home today. They're going to talk to their parents. No. <laughs> um, ideally, they're going to talk to their parents, and they're going to answer the age-old question, what did you learn at school today? And so they said, well, we had this guy... Liability. <laughs> well, we had this guy who's running for Congress, and I think most of the people in this room are in the second district. We've got some in the first, and a couple in... in, in your How many in Illinois? Illinois. Okay, one or two. Okay, so you're, you, you know, you're, you're not in the, uh, the second. Okay, how many to the east of Beloit? Yeah. You're in the first. You know you're in the first. Okay. So when these guys, when the when the second districters come come home, you know, we met this guy Peter Turner running for Congress. What do you hope that they communicate to their parents about you? That in turn they take to the voting polls. Vote for me. Two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> well, why? Why? why what, what is it you think is the tipping point? The factor that okay, we're going to go over him over here. Well, you know your parents better than I do. So you would know more what, what would, would, would sway them. Uh, several things. First of all, uh, in terms of, again, the economic growth for your future, uh, we also have seen now we've got the, the, the federal government's response to many things has been pretty much incompetent. Um, we had, again, the Ebola response, so that was the, the Center for Disease Control, the National Institutes for Health. Recently, there was, uh, like two days ago, there was news that the Department of Defense had managed to drop um, ammunition to ISIS instead of to the Kurds. So even the Department of Defense is not able to do its job as it ought to do. So what we've got is Department of Defense, for example, may still be funding breast cancer research. Worthy cause, but why is it the Defense Department funding that? NIH was funding um, Origami condoms. Mm, CDC was funding gun control and bike paths. Again, not part of their um, basic responsibilities. So let's let's have government focus on established justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense. Provide for the common defense. The but but notice it. Notice it. Establish, ensure, provide. Active verbs to do, promote, that's advertising. So the promote is, yes, we should encourage the general welfare. It's not provide the general welfare. A difference there in terms of conservative bent versus a more socialist bent. So that's what I would suggest if there's some things to think about uh, when you're talking to your parents. Again, I am pro-life and... Um, as mentioned, I uh, believe that marriage is between a man and a woman. How many of you are 18 and you vote this? Just that? No, he isn't. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Thanks, 14. All right, the bell's going to ring in a second, so don't forget, you've got a one page summary to collect tomorrow. Um, and then in government proper, uh, don't forget to bring in your candidate journals, and you've got your, your quizzes over uh, congressional leadership. Oh, man. Is so that today? Yes. Yeah. Yeah.